Thank you very much. Yeah, we already know the answer, but okay. I will try to explain the things that we did to try to get the answer for the challenge of this year. Uh, so my name is Mirna Vasquez. I will present this work, uh, but similar as Derry, I'm also a microbiologist that is learning some computational, so be kind. <laughs> Okay, uh, and also I want to, to mention that I'm going to present the work that we did like as a group. We were working on this, a lot of undergrads and grad students during the summer. So I will present the work that uh, many people did. So yeah, so this is all of us. I divided the talk in different topics. So it's easier for us, or at least for me, to try to explain you what we did. So I will start talking about microbial diversity and metagenomics. And then what did we learn about the CAMDA challenge, the two challenges that we were uh, trying to solve, and some extra analysis that we decided to do with this data, and some conclusions about it. So, okay, let's go and talk about microbial diversity and metagenomics. So I was very interested in this challenge when they invited me to work with them, uh, with the team, because this challenge is about microbes and microbes are very interesting. <laughs> microbes are actually super diverse. I'm just showing you some numbers because someone made some calculations and they found that there are a lot of microbial diversity in the oceans, even more than stars in the universe if we make some numbers. So that's amazing to me. <laughs> and that also can be observed in the tree of life that I'm showing you there which is the most recent version of it. And if you look closer to this tree, you will see that most of the branches uh, belong to bacteria and some other to archaea. The eukaryotes are just right here, so they are really few. Uh, but the most interesting thing from this tree is that if we look to the tip of some of these branches, you will see uh, some red dots on this uh, big tree. And these red dots represent uh, lineages that have only been seen or observed in the microbial diversity through metagenomics, which is amazing because it's most of the diversity. So I know that for now, we most, uh, most of you know already what is metagenomics, but I will try to explain you for those of, uh, of you that are not really familiar with it. So metagenomics, literally, it means going beyond genomics. So instead of studying just the genes of one species or only one organism, we are studying the genes of the whole environmental sample. The environmental sample can be whatever we want. It can be a soil sample, the gut, uh, or whatever we want. So we extract the DNA, we make the sequencing of this DNA, and from that we get reads that can be short or long, it depends on the technique that we use. And then with these reads, we can reconstruct maps, but also we can just use the, the reads and profile the, metabol the metabolic uh, capabilities of all the microbes living there. And also we can build some phylogenetic trees like this and uh, start to guess diversity, like the taxonomy of the sample. So this is metagenomic. This is the microbial diversity. This is the whole universe of microbes that are there. And I was interested in this because the CAMDA challenge this year is like framed on these huge data sets that we have now related to um, metagenomics. And the idea of the challenge is interesting, like we have a lot of data in the biological science, and how can we use this data? What can we do with all this information? So for this challenge, most of you know, because you were working on this. <laughs> we had a lot of metagenomes, 365 samples distributed in these cities all across the, the world. And uh, we also had what we decided to call the mysterious sample. And the mysterious sample was these antimicrobial resistant patterns from different isolates. And it was basically a table that it was looking like this, where in each of the columns, we had the presence and absence of these different antimicrobial resistant genes. And in the rows, we had like the different isolates. So these were the input data. And the two kind of challenges this year were like to try to use this antimicrobial resistant uh, table to predict from where uh, all these genes came from, like which is the city from where all these genes were isolated or were um, sequenced. So that was the idea. We had just one clue to try to start modeling. The clue was this, that uh, um, the antimicrobial resistant patterns came from a hospital in, in USA somewhere. Uh, so those were the, the things that we had. And the other challenge is the forensic challenge. So the idea of this challenge is also interesting. We basically are gonna try to classify the metagenome samples by cities. 
So this is an example to try to illustrate this challenge or the way we understood the challenge. We have two cities here, Bogota and Sao Paulo. Uh, we have the microbial diversity from different uh, places within the city. And it would be easy if, for example, uh, this is just representing the diversity in OTUs. So if, for example, Bogota has a lot of brown and a lot of uh, pink uh, reeds, meaning a lot of brown and pink diversity, while Sao Paulo has this green diversity and also this pink diversity. So if we had a pattern like that in all the cities, it would be, it would be very simple just to classify the cities because the pattern is clear. But it's not always the, that's not always the case. So we have two, two ways of approach to these problems, the supervised algorithms and also the unsupervised algorithms. So these are also the ways that we approach to it. Uh, in the case of the supervised algorithms, for example, we, we come back to these two cities, Bogota and Sao Paulo, and what we did was to try to break these data sets in two types of data, the test and the training data sets. We use the training the data set to feed some models, and then we start the prediction of the test set to try to see from where it was, uh, the sample came from. That's the supervised model. And in the case of the unsupervised model, we use the whole data set. We didn't break it into different uh, test sets or whatever. We use the whole thing to try to put this into a dimensional uh, space and see how they cluster. And for example, here we are showing that in this case, the mysterious sample, where that it's, ooh, that it's represented by this uh -huh, red square, it clusters uh, with Sao Paulo. And so we can say, oh, the mysterious sample came from Sao Paulo and things like that. So this is the unsupervised type of algorithm. So we use these two approaches to try to solve these two challenges, the mis from where the mysterious sample come from, and also uh, to try to classify the cities. Mm, so we download all these metagenomes and then we start doing all this um, processing of the data. Uh, we had our raw reads. Uh, we used trim galore to trim all the, to take the adapters and contaminations. And then we use megahit to get the assemblies of all of these uh, metagenome samples. And basically then with the assemblies, we run Kraken to create the taxonomic profiles. And then we use CAR to create, to create the antimicrobial resistant profile. Okay, this is just basically what we did. So let's go to the antimicrobial resistant challenge. So as I was saying at the beginning, we had this table uh, from with the genes uh, from the isolates. So what we had to do first was to try to annotate the genomes or the metagenomes uh, using the IDs that we found in that uh, table. So for that, as many other uh, people here, we use this database that is called CAR. Uh, the Comprehensive Antibiotic Resistant Database to try to annotate we, the, the metagenome. So basically, we took the IDs from this big table and we look for all these IDs into the microbial, into the CAR database. And that way, we try to extract the sequences uh, from that database. That didn't work. <laughs> I mean, it worked, but not for all the, the gene markers that were present in this table. We were only able to identify uh, 180 IDs of this MRA uh, um, sample. So we had to do, uh, we had to create manually a database, meaning that we went to the databases like, for example, Uniprot and CBI to try to search for the rest of the IDs that we couldn't find in the CARD database. So we created uh, this database and then we had, let's say that we had two databases, the CAR database and the manually created database. And we use both things to annotate all the metagenomes. So there were many ways of doing this. So as we have seen, but we decided to extract the context that were related to the isolates uh, of the in the mysterious sample, meaning we try to extract the context from Enterobacter, Klebsiella, and also Escherichia coli. And we did this by following two different approaches. The first approach is by co-assembly all the different metagenomes by city, and then we extract the different uh, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Escherichia coli that we found in the sample, and we annotate all of these uh, contexts with CAR. The other way 
uh, we also extracted the context, w w context was, was used by extracting by genera using, for example, Kraken, the output from Kraken. That way we extracted the contexts that were associated with these uh, isolates, and then we assemble uh, all these contexts, and then uh, we annotated with CAR. So following this strategy, um, well, uh, we were able to cluster or try to cluster uh, the different resistant mechanisms that were described or the yeah that were described within CAR and try to see how the mysterious sample cluster with all of this. And yes, we found that New York was closer, uh, closer to the mysterious sample, meaning in the case of Enterobacter. Similar thing we found in Klebsiella. Uh, however, we couldn't find this pattern in E. coli. The mysterious samples seem to be more similar or more closer to Denver instead of New York. So by this point, we were just pretty sure that New York was the mysterious, uh, were the source of the mysterious sample. However, now that we know that it's Baltimore, if we look closer to the Klebsiella plot, we can see that the second thing that was closer to New York uh, was Baltimore. So probably we were close. <laughs> well, okay, so we were wondering why, why uh, E. coli had a different pattern. So we tried to see, like, uh, well, we make these questions to ourselves, how different is the abundance of the different bacteria in this sample? So we use uh, the OTU table to try to see the abundance of each of these different genera. And what we observe is that uh, Enterobacter and Klebsiella are really abundant in the different metagenomes from the US. However, Escherichia coli is not really abundant. So we thought that probably the, the reason why we saw that pattern is just because it's not abundant somehow in these uh, metagenomes. So we try another clustering approach. Uh, we use the CART uh, markers and usually the manually uh, curated markers and what we observe is by uh, using all of the data, we could uh, classify um, the, uh, the, entero, the Escherichia coli uh, context with the New York City um, um, sample. So we were happy because of that. Uh, also, it's interesting, once we knew that Baltimore was the, actually the, <laughs> the result or, yeah, or the, the city, we look closer to this graph and we were wondering why we got that result. And what we observe is that we are clustering this uh, city or, or, or the mysterious sample with uh, New York City because it has more MRA, um, antimicrobial resistant genes. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. So we use another type of algorithms to try to see if we could recover a different pattern or the same pattern. Uh, we use these non-supervised algorithms using UMAP method uh, for distance. And in the case of the car markers, we could cluster again the mysterious sample with New York City. Using only the manually created markers, we were also able to, cl to cluster the mysterious sample with New York City. And similar pattern we observe when we use only the contexts that were associated with Klebsiella. Also, we classify the mysterious sample with New York City. So our first conclusion was obvious. New York City is the source of the mysterious sample. Then we realized this not, it's just Baltimore. They come from the um, um, John Hopkins Hospital. So we went back to the data, we observed, the thing that we all have observed today is that New York City has a lot of more samples, has more sequence in depth. So that's probably why. We were also looking at the markers and the number of markers, uh, antimicrobial resistant markers in the different samples. And what we observe is that in Baltimore, we don't really have all the markers, or we have all of them, but we have very few with respect to New York City. Similar happens in the co-assembled samples. We also have the same pattern. We have a lot of, we have more uh, marker genes in New York City than in Baltimore. So we think that's the reason why our all of our modeling is clustering with uh, New York City instead of Baltimore. So our conclusion here is that we need more sequencing <laughs> in Baltimore so we can uh, find a different result. Okay, 
So in the case of the forensic challenge, so as I mentioned before, we understood the CAMDA challenge in these two ways, uh, like the resistant patterns uh, using the antimicrobial resistant table and also the metagenome classification uh, by cities. So we are working with the metagenome. So we have two levels of information, the metabolic profile, which is basically all the genes that code for some function and belong to some metabolic pathway and the diversity profile, which is basically, and well, I mean, well, the taxonomic diversity that can be uh, obtained for some specific markers or like 16S or whatever. So we try to uh, do this classification, metagenome classification by using these two levels of information. We understand the classification mod, uh, problem as a case of a statistical prediction. Basically, we have uh, different variables like uh, the abundance of the OTUs. We have the antimicrobial resistant patterns, for example. We have the origin of the city. And we can use this information to fit a model, for example, with a logistic regression or some machine learning. And then we can use all these models to make prediction. So this is basically what we are doing. We have different ways of measure how good are our predictions. Uh, we basically are seeing the, uh, the rates of uh, false positives, and we are uh, looking closer to the F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of the precision of the recall, which is the um, uh, rate of false positives. So we start by classifying the cities using functional data. Uh, for that, we took the assemblies, the context that we obtained, and we used these two databases to create a, a table like this uh, for the uh, functional profile. These two databases are MiFaser and MetaPsych. So uh, in the functional world, in the annotation world of functional databases, uh, some of these databases have labels, um, levels, levels, yeah. Uh, like, uh, yeah, like for example, we can find like level one, which is just carbo something degradation or nitrogen degradation, which is a very broad categories. And we can go deep into the categories in the annotation to probably just getting to enzyme and the specific function of the enzyme. So we annotate oh, the, all the assemblies uh, following these two, uh, when using these two annotation tools. And that way we created the functional profiles. The functional profiles were looking something like this, where in each of the columns we have the ID of the different enzymes or whatever we were annotating at that point. And in the rows we had the cities. So with these functional profiles that we create, we uh, start to train in our models uh, we split our data set to create a training set that uh, then we again um, split in five folds that we use to fit these different models that I'm showing you here. Then we got the best parameters for each of them. And then um, we got the best, uh, the best parameters that we could for each of the models. And then we started a voting process where we selected the best model that we could. Uh, this voting section was divided in two. Uh, the voting section was hard or soft, depending. Hard means that we took just the best model that we could fit. And soft means that we took into consideration that the different models also consider different things. And we then use all these models to evaluate uh, our predictions and, and create an F1 score. So these were our results. Uh, it turns out that the annotation with the database called MIFASER was the best. Uh, also, the best uh, classification was done with the level four of the functional annotation. And the algorithm that worked better was the MLP algorithm, uh, which can be observed here. We uh, almost hit the 0.8% uh, of accuracy. And you can observe that in the confusion matrix that is next to it, where you can see how well uh, this model could predict the origin of the city. So it's not great, but it's good. <laughs> then we try to do the same thing with the, with the microbial, um, with the diversity profile. So the diversity profile, it's basically all the OTUs or all the diversity, or the way we want to uh, get taxonomy. So it can be a table with the different labels 
also like for example because we have different taxonomical labels for example for, for example phylum order class whatever so we try to create tables with the different labels and also for each of the different um, cities so that can be a lot of data so one of the first things that we decided to do was to create a way to select variables that or the most important OTUs that could allow us to classify the cities. Uh, this was the pipeline that we follow. So we had the samples, we create a table very similar to the one that I show you in the case of the uh, functional profile. Uh, this time we had the taxonomic labels, uh, labels uh, here. And we then select, um, create this algorithm to select specific variables, uh, specific OTUs that could be um, um, good for uh, our comparisons, our model uh, classification. And then we run the models uh, over this short data set. So how did we did this short uh, version of the OTU table? So we used a negative binomial regression uh, to identify differential OTUs between cities. So basically this, so we have an OTU in one city that has, a, um, that has an abundance. We calculate its mean. We look at the same OTU in a different city. We also calculate the mean in this uh, specific city. And then with this information, we calculated a global mean for each of these uh, OTUs. And then uh, we saw the deviation from the global mean of each of the OTUs. In this way, we were able to reduce our OT OTU table to 300 OTUs that were able to differenti differentiate between cities. So this, we thought this is an improvement because there's a lot of data for all the people that have done metagenomics, we know that can have a lot of data and this is well, we thought we think it's good because now we can work with the small data that can also uh, make predictions. So, uh, if we look at the distribution of the data of the whole data set of the OTUs and the reduced one, which is the one uh, here, uh, it's, it looks really similar. So, we think that that this distribution is showing that we can do reduce the data set to these uh, few OTUs and still having or the same data structure. Uh, so we use that to start classify the cities. Uh, we took the table and we also make um, the splitting of, of the data to create a training set. We run these different models and we then test the model. In this case, uh, we were uh, we were trying to be very careful, so we did an extra step here to try to see that we were not overfitting our model uh, by doing this uh, random uh, splitting. And it was really good, actually. Uh, the results from this uh, um, the, this from this algorithm showed that we can uh, obtain an F1 score of point. 96% using this uh, method super vector classifier. And this can also be observed here in the confusion matrix. If you remember the one that I showed you before with the annotation data, uh, we had a lot of missing numbers here. <laughs> but uh, using this data, using these models, we were able to uh, accurately classify most of the cities. We had problems with New York City and also with Zurich uh, in Oakland in some of these uh, faults. But we think it's good. We have 0.96% of F1. So we think this is a very good prediction and a very good model to classify the cities. So this was something that we were doing, trying to solve the challenges of CAMDA. And then we went crazy and we tried to do some extra analysis and some extra things to try to solve the problem. Uh, so now I'm gonna talk about these extra analysis that we did that are related to topology, to regression and metapangenomics that are not uh, something that we usually do in microbiome analysis, but it can be uh, applied. So I will try to show you the applications that we found for these um, uh, tools. Also, I want to mention that IDEP, who is there, <laughs> she has a poster and she's doing actually her postdoc on topology. So you can, if you have a lot of questions about topology, you can uh, reach to her. Uh, that's her poster number. 
So what is topology <laughs> and what are topological data analysis? Well, topology is a branch of mathematics that uh, study these geometric structures. So um, I'm a biologist, I mentioned that before. So to me, these are different shapes. But if we look closer mathematically, we would see that the cup here, like this, and this donut here are actually topologically the same. So I wasn't sure about that, but then I did convince me that that's, that's how it is. And, <laughs> and yeah, so topological data analysis actually help us to see these patterns that are not obvious for us at the first glance. So we saw the thing, we don't think there are a hidden pattern, but there is. <laughs> and that's what uh, topology data analysis does. So the idea was just trying to use this topological data analysis to try to predict the origin of the mysterious sample. So how does this topological data analysis work? Well, basically we have a space here, mm -hmm, here, and we have different dots. These dots represent data. In this case, it represents genes. And this, uh, this, each of these dots are represented like lines in blue here. And what, it's ha what happens with this analysis with time is that these dots start, uh, start like um, increasing in size, like the diameter of these uh, dots start increasing. And with time, uh, these dots start to connect to each other and it becomes like a whole, uh, like, a, like a unit. At the beginning, they are considered like different points that are not connected, but if they start increasing, they connect uh, and they can also create these things that we call holes that we can talk about more lately. So if we look at the squares there that had these letters A, B, C, D, it representing these uh, different dots uh, that are called connected components. So if we start connecting the components, instead of having four, we start to have it three and so on, no? to, in, uh, to the point where we just have one. So an interesting thing, of the topological data analysis for biologists like me is that the trees do not contain holes, meaning that they do not have these spaces here. So we can use that property to try to study the trees, for example, horizontal gene transfer events that are represented in the topological space as holes. I didn't know that, and it's amazing. So this is uh, just how the components get connected through time, and if we saw this connection between uh, one of them, that's how we will see a hole, that for biologists it would mean an event of horizontal gene transfer, which can be interesting. So we use this approach of topological data analysis to try to see uh, if, how, if we could cluster the mysterious sample somehow. And here in the first plot, it, the one that says threshold point one, uh, the different dots represent the different metagenomes. The green ones represent the mysterious sample. The red ones represent New York City. And when we start increasing the dots, what happens with the threshold of 0.2 is that the mysterious samples connect with the metagenome of New York City. So we thought, yeah, again, <laughs> it's New York, but it's not. <laughs> so yeah, OK. So but we know that this method has an application on horizontal gene transfer uh, um, prediction. So we tried to see if we could see in horizontal gene transfer events between Klebsiella, Escherichia, and Enterobacter. And we did found that, and that's represented in this plot here. So if we look closer, we will see that we have these blue dots uh, in the plot. These dots represent the holes which are uh, what I was trying to explain to you before, the events of horizontal gene transfer, meaning that there are events of horizontal gene transfer between these three uh, isolates. Uh, we tried to see if there were, we could find horizontal gene transfer events in each of these uh, bacteria, and we found that in, in Escherichia coli, we could see or we can find uh, some holes, meaning some events of horizontal gene transfer, and we couldn't find find any in Enterobacter. So this was one of these extra analyses that we tried to do. To do. The other uh, extra analysis that we also tried was to try to correlate the uh, taxonomy or the diversity 
with some other parameters, like for example, the bioclimatic uh, characteristics of each of the cities and also the demographic uh, characteristics of each of them. So for that, we did this Dirichlet regression model and we were not able, we were able to find that, for example, in the case of Denver, it seems that there is a correlation between the OTUs and also these variables, like, for example, um, the demographic and the bioclimatic um, variables. Then someone else was like, yeah, let's do meta metapangenomics. So we're doing that. So <laughs> that will try to explain you uh, the results that we got from the metapan genome analysis. So we had these three isolates, Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and Escherichia coli. So we download the genomes that we could find in NCBI from, in this case, I will show you just the results from Klebsiella. We downloaded the genomes from Klebsiella uh, that were uh, uh, isolate, uh, that were uploaded from hospitals in the years 2016 and 2017, and we uh, performed the pangenome uh, reconstruction. So we had all these strains. Uh, we get the gene clusters uh, with these uh, specific isolates, and we create a, a figure like this, where we uh, were able to obtain the accessory genes for these Klebsiella genomes, and also the core genes for all of them. Uh, this is a pangenome. And the metapangenome, for that, what we did was to take the, um, the reads for the different cities uh, in the US, and we cross map all these uh, uh, reads to the different uh, strains uh, that we had. We already know if the genes of the strain belong to the core or their accessory genome. So that way, we could obtain something like this, which is just the genome of the strain and the reads that map uh, according to different, the different cities. Um, and we got something like this. This is just a preview figure of what we did. And finally, we got uh, um, a figure like this. We had a tree. Uh, we are showing here the different isolates, which would be Klebsiella, Enterobacter, and, and Escherichia coli. And here, this ring with the blue and, and red um, Squares is showing if that region belongs to the accessory or to the core genome. So here I'm showing you just the result from Klebsiella. And we were able to find two clusters of Klebsiella. We thought that's interesting. <laughs> we don't really know what it helps in the challenge, but it's interesting. We found two, uh, two clusters of Klebsiella. But it's interesting that uh, and the colors inside represent the different cities from where we could uh, obtain these genomes. And the interesting thing is that uh, there are regions that are shown or trying to be shown with these arrows here. Uh, there are regions of the genome that are not shared with the genomes from, for example, New York or San Antonio or uh, Minnesota. So we think that maybe the antimicrobial resistant table was not helpful, but there must be, there must be another gene markers that can be helpful to identify this specific city, um, this specific city. Yeah, boy. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is just a ring showing you the, the reads from the different cities and the metagenomes. And yeah, so the problem is, that we observe is that Baltimore doesn't have enough coverage. So even though we have this region here from the genomes from um, Klebsiella in the databases that could be interesting, it was not sequenced or not recovered in the metagenomes. So it can be a good marker, but it's not present in the metagenomes. <laughs> so our conclusion is that we need more uh, sequence and depth. <laughs> uh, so what did we learn? Okay, uh, we had the, the try to make the prediction with the CAR database. We were not able to identify Baltimore. We identified New York. And we think it's just because of that we need more coverage in Baltimore. Uh, however, we successfully uh, reduced the OTU table and we were able to make predictions with this short table. So we think that's an improvement. That's something that we can use in another analysis maybe. Uh, we can could classify uh, the cities uh, using this OTU table that was reduced. And we tried to be very careful on all the things that we were doing, and we created a very nice repository that you can go and check if you want to try to see something else. Uh, you can just check it out. 
And also, uh, no, well, nothing more. <laughs> I just want to thank all the people that work. We were many. Most of us, uh, some of us in, um, most of them are undergrad students. So I think they did a really good job. And thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you. It's an impressive amount of work, but uh, as you see, the team is was large, but also the coordinating. Uh, I, I think it will be now interesting, you know, to somehow put everything together to just draw uh, mm -hmm. to, to more, more nicer, nicer, nice story. It's already great. But it's, yeah, we I'm, will. I'm impressed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> any any questions from from the audience? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's, that's great. Um, I'm loving your meta pan genome or pan meta genome, whatever. It is. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering how, because because it, it's based on 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 coverage data. So how mm -hmm. quantitative is it? If you have a, a whole depth of coverage over over one accessory gene and other other accessory genes is, is there, but it's it's quite low coverage depth. Do you do you capture that, or you, is it just literally presence absence? In this case, it's just presence absence because we download the genomes and we don't have coverage information from that, just from the metagenomes. I don't know if I understood your question, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it would be great if we had that. And also you're, you're assigning different, oh sorry, you're assigning each gene on the basis, was it Rory you used? Or so they have to have some cutoff where you just decide whether different, maybe different alleles of the, of the same orthologous genes mm. are, are, are actually different genes or not, that, that's, that. Yeah, the cutoff is really lax. So right? to try so to find the, so uh -huh, bigger yeah. clusters, but yeah, we can play with that and see if we can find something different. And I suspect your two clusters there might be the capsule locus because ah. that's a big chunk that because mm -hmm. it's it's one big thing that's either there or not, right? So that, that's mm -hmm. we don't know. We we haven't get there yet, but it would be interesting to see the annotation. Other questions? Okay. Thanks for doing that. It's really good for the community, right? I actually just have a quick question. So when you compared the cities with different numbers of features, did you try just restricting it to the set of features that was common to all of them, right? To do maybe a no, kind of a mark but that, that that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, maybe it wouldn't work still, right? But maybe just as we a can try. completeness of story. Yeah. <laughs>